Right now, as I want to introduce to you our guest speaker, a very special guest speaker today. And uh, it's really a privilege that we have as a region uh, to have our dear regional overseer from the Greenwich and Suffolk region in London to bless us today. It's very busy, and uh, he has other programs that are lined up today, but he has been so gracious to make himself and his time available to bless us today. He will be ministering to us on the minister's character. So it gives me a great pleasure to welcome our regional overseer from Greenwich and Suffolk region in London in the person of Pastor Godi Waribako. You're welcome, Pastor Godi. You have the platform for the next 50 minutes to bless us. So you're most welcome. And I pray that we'll continue to remain blessed in Jesus' name. I'll just hand over to our coordinator so that she can continue. Thank you and God bless you. Praise the Lord. We will worship him in spirit and in truth in Jesus' name. So we're moving on to our next um, session, which is the Music Symposium. Um, so we're starting at 11.20. Um, it's only an hour session. Um, so we, just to let us know briefly before we start, there's water at the back for any of us that need to um, just hydrate ourselves. Um, the, the music is going to be two groups. So the, the music ministers, which is the main um, choir members, you'll be meeting in the main auditorium. Um, that's in the main um, Zoom room, um, which is, is here. And our music uh, directors, um, those are our choir leaders, you'll be going downstairs to the breakout room. Um, so we have uh, our facilitators um, which will be taking the sessions. We're going to have the session that will be taken here. We have a brother Gide, um, the regional choir leader from Merseyside and Wales. He'll be taking that as a live session here. And then we have um, the session for the session downstairs. It's going to be um, Sister Chi. Um, she's an accountant and a regional choir region um, choir leader for Play Store region. So she will be um, handling that session for us. So um, if we could quickly just uh, move to that. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I'm uh, privileged and honored to be here uh, this morning and um, been blessed so far immensely by the messages that have come from our um, regional overseer at the, at the start towards an excellent ministry and the just concluded message by uh, Pastor Goddy um, from London. And um, I've been blessed so far and I can only hope and pray that um, we will be blessed through this message and discussions that we're having at this time. Let us have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for yet another opportunity to, for us to gather for fellowship. We thank you for your spirit, which is here and has been nourishing us. Uh, we thank you for how you have been revealing things to us that pertain to an excellent music ministry. Lord, we pray you will plant in every heart that which was found in Daniel, an excellent spirit. And as we make progress, continue with us in Jesus' name. 
um, complete what you have started in our lives and ministry. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Praise the Lord. Um, at this time, we'll be exploring the uh, topic, um, identifying and dealing with the little foxes that breed mediocre music ministration. That is quite a mouthful. Identifying and dealing with the little foxes uh, that breed mediocre music ministration. And in Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 15, Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible gives us a clear warning. And I think we should um, remind ourselves as we read together Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 15. It says, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Brothers and sisters, if we know the Song of Solomon very well, um, it would seem strange that in the middle of what I call a romantic letter, uh, that the topic of fox hunting should arise. That is not something you usually find in a romantic um, letter exchange between um, two lovers. But as students of the Bible, we know that this is purely symbolic. And in the previous um, um, chapter leading up to this, it, it draws reference to a vineyard. Now, if that blooming vineyard spreading its sweet scent and fragrance, if that vineyard refers to the growing romance between the two couples, then we can include that in this chapter 2, um, that the foxes in verse 15, they represent problems, problems that could damage the relationship prior to marriage. In short, what Solomon was telling us in that verse of scripture is that we need to take preventative measures, preventative cares to protect this love from anything that could harm it. And likewise, we have not called ourselves into this ministry. God has called us. We have not taken this honor to ourselves, but the Lord himself is the one that has called each and every one of us to this noble singing ministry, proclaiming his gospel message through hymns and songs. And he has given us, each and every one of us, he has given us skills, he has given us talents, giftings, as tools, essential tools. And just like the Lord blessed uh, Bezalel and oh Ohaliab and the other skilled um, craftsmen with wisdom and ability to perform any task involved in building the sanctuary. Above all, he has also given us the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to make administration effective. And with all of that, it is expedient. It is expedient for each and every one of us uh, if we are to be faithful, if we are to be effective ministers, to watch, to be watchful. And not just to be watchful, but also to be vigilant of the little foxes here and there that will ultimately compromise the effectiveness of administration, which in turn will breed mediocre music ministration. And if this is to be the case, then we must take heed to the words of the preacher in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, um, just a few pages back in your, in your Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, where it says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, there is no work, there is no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And in this passage, Solomon is teaching us that now is the time for us to work with care. Now is the time for us to work with energy. Now is the time for us to work with skill and purpose. Why? Because time is ticking. The time is ticking. Time is running out. Because we are only here for a moment. And it says there is no work, no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave. Brothers and sisters, I put it to you that with all the talent and gifting we have, I put it to you, your, your singing ability 
is not enough. Your skill and your craftsmanship to be able to pen lyrics, to score notes, to play instruments, that in itself in this ministry is not enough. Anybody can sing. Anybody can play the musical instruments. Anybody can put pen on paper and write songs. It is not enough. The question is, with all the talent and the gifting that you have, what are you doing with that talent? What are you doing with that gifting? How are you developing and growing your talent? What result has it yielded? Is your talent bearing any fruit? Is it contributing to the encouragement, to the edification of others? We must understand that the talents and gifting God has deposited into our lives are God's investment. They are God's in investment into our lives. And therefore, like any investor, like any investor, he expects it to grow in value and yield greater results. And these gifts and talent that God has deposited into our lives, it must be backed up with training. And that is why I said just having that ability is not enough. It must be backed up with training. It must be backed up with hard work and much prayers. Only then with the Holy Spirit multiply our efforts and cause us to be fruitful. Many have gone to the grave with talents. Many have gone to the grave with giftings that did not live up to its potential. And why is that? Because they had a mediocre mindset. They had a mediocre attitude, approach to their endeavors. For us, having this understanding, having this knowledge, it should therefore caution us that we do not go down the same direction. And as we look at this, um, um, uh, this topic, identifying and dealing with the little foxes that breed mediocre uh, music um, mi mi ministry, we'll look at just two things two things, as our title has um, points us to. It says we need to first identify those little foxes. And then it says we have to then deal with those um, little foxes. How do we deal with them? And when we make the needed changes, when we make the corrections, when we make the adjustments, what are some of the benefits we stand to gain? So I'll go straight to the uh, first point here. And this is where I'm going to need your help as well. So I'm going to be asking some questions. I'm going to try my best to make this as interactive as, as possible because it's all our ministry. We are, we are all together in this ministry and together we want to identify those little foxes that have been a bear bug in our ministry and we also want to discuss together how we intend together as a team, as a family, to be able to deal and address those little foxes. And the first thing I want to ask, and it may sound basic, but to you, what does it mean? What does the word mediocre mean? Anybody? Mediocre. What does it mean? When you hear mediocre, what, what comes to mind? Substandard, Brother Ernest. Substandard. Anybody else? Mediocre? Average. Thank you, sir. Any other? In your own words. Mediocre. Substandard. Average. One more. Average, I think, yes, just, just in line with what our, our, our brother said. So lukewarm, neither here nor there. And someone says that mediocrity is the enemy of progress. And it is true. Mediocrity is the enemy of uh, progress. Because widespread mediocrity threatens the advancement and effectiveness of any ministry as it encourages you, it encourages a just enough to get by attitude. Just enough to get by. And when we settle for just enough to get by, we can never excel. We can never make progress. And that is why mediocrity is so dangerous. And it is something that we want to deal with and address. The attitude that, that encourages us to operate with the barest minimum effort. The barest minimum effort. We come to choir practice, we have a, an hour, a couple of hours in choir practice, and we go home, and that's it. There is no, we're not putting any more effort individually. We're not doing more at home. We're not taking time to expand on what we have done in choir practice. We've just settled for the practice sessions and that is it until next week. 
mediocre. That is mediocre. We must understand that God gave us, he gave humanity his very best. His absolute best for our salvation. And we know the scripture very well in John chapter 3 verse 16 and 17. And it's, it's there for us to, as a reminder for us. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So God gave us his absolute best, the best heaven could offer. And we should remember that God has also called us. He has called us to a higher standard of perfection. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10, which we read earlier on, it challenges us that whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Therefore, anything, anything we do that falls short of our very best for God, draws his displeasure. It draws this, and that is very important for us to understand. Anything that we do that is average, anything that we do that is substandard, draws his displeasure. As the church in Laodicea, they found, they found this out the hard way. They found this out there in Revelation chapter 3, verse uh, 15, uh, 15 and 16. God declared to the Laodicean church, I know thy works. We may not be conscious, but God knows our work. God knows your work. God knows the effort or the lack of it that you are putting into the ministry. He sees our attitude. He knows our disposition. He examines how we respond to correction and discipline, in particular in the music ministry. He sees that. It may not be obvious to the physical eyes. Our behavior, our negative disposition, our, our sort of um, unbecoming attitude when we're being corrected, when we're being disciplined. It may not be obvious to the physical eyes, but God sees it. He says, I know thy works. He says that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would rather thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, we have a nonchalant attitude happy to settle for the barest minimum. Because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And basically, God says he will reject our worship. If we're settling for anything substandard, if we're average, if we're nonchalant in administration, he says he, re he will reject it, just as he spewed out the, f the worship of the Laodicean church. Likewise, God will also do that um, with our ministration. Therefore, this must necessitate our need to examine ourselves and the quality of work we are producing for the Lord. First, by separating the wheat from the chaff in identifying those behaviors and attitudes that make administration ineffective. And I want to ask another question, and I think I want a bit more participation. You know, we've, some of us have probably been in the music ministry for a long time. Um, you know, so we're all experienced here, I believe. And in your years in the ministry, what are those little foxes that we should look out for? I, I want to hear from you. I have some of mine that I, you know, I've, I've come across over the years, but I want to also, also want to hear from you. I want us to, to learn together. What are those little foxes that we should look out for in our music ministry? Anyone? Yes, sir. Laziness, laziness, laziness. We're working for God and, and we're lazy. Any, any, any other? Yes, sir. Murmuring. We'll come on to that later. What happened to the children of um, Israel? Yes, sister at the back. Pride and disunity. Pride and disunity. Our pastor mentioned earlier in this message that this ministry was Lucifer's ministry in heaven. And what was the end of Lucifer? What ruined him? Pride. Pride. And that is the biggest, biggest. I don't, even, I don't even call it a little fox. It's a huge fox in the choir ministry. Pride and disunity. I saw Brother Johanna, sir. Prayerlessness. This is a spiritual work. We cannot, 
go into battle with the enemy with mundane instrument. We need supernatural, spiritual instrument. Prayer is what we have as, a, as an instrument. Any other little foxes we've come across. Yes, brother. Stubbornness and disobedience. Stubbornness and disobedience. So all these things, when we mention them, when we look at them, it doesn't paint a picture of a united. It doesn't paint a picture of a glorified singing ministry. And every single thing that we've mentioned, you're absolutely correct. Laziness, prayerlessness, pride, disobedience. And, and, and these are all traits of the enemy. These are not traits that belong in the ministry that belongs to God. It doesn't belong there. I also have here lack of vision. Lack of vision. We know that the overall aim, the overall um, objective of the singing ministry is so we can draw people to the presence of God. We can draw the presence of God down in our midst. That is, one of the, that is the core purpose of ministry. But when you stand as a chorister to minister, what is your purpose? What vision do you have? I often challenge my choir in Liverpool that, listen, I'm tired of hearing testimonies of where people say, oh, I went to this um, crusade, I went to this um, um, church service, and as the choir was singing, things were just happening. As the choir was singing, I was being delivered. I said, I'm tired of it. I want to experience it. And I think that should also be our mindset. When last have you sang? And somebody has said, as the, as the, as the choir was singing, I just felt a release. I felt, be, I felt I was delivered from this bondage. When we stand and sing, what is your vision? What is that thing you expect God to do? Or are you just content that people applaud and say, well done, my brother, what a fantastic solo. Well done, my sister, what a fantastic soprano. My brother, you played the keyboard with great mastery. I would just contend. And, and is that to the end with which we minister? Lack of vision. The Bible says that um, the people perish for lack of vision. In a ministry where there's no goal, in a ministry where there's no direction, no sense of purpose, such will always produce a mediocre result. It will always produce a mediocre result. Indifference, lack of passion, lack of passion. I've been to practice sessions where, I, and I'm able to tell when somebody is tired. We've just come back from work. I had a long day, work, college, school. I can understand that. But I've also been in practice sessions where I've just seen people just, it's as though they've been dragged to the choir practice session. My brother, my sister, we have, um, oh, Pastor just announced we're going to have a program next week. It's short notice. He wants us to have a special number ready, two special numbers ready. I'm going to demand, I'm going to re request that, please, we have practice straight away after today's uh, church service. And we're just there thinking, we've done search the scripture. We've done... Um, message now you want us to stay behind it when there's indifference indifference lack of passion the ministry where there's indifference where there's lack of interest and passion such a ministry cannot be excellent in fact indifference is an attitude that God detests he rejected the Laodicean church in Revelation because of it judgment came upon the nation of Edom because of indifference an indifferent minister is unprofitable to his master. And not before long, such a servant will be displaced. Not before long, such a servant will be displaced. Another thing is inconsistency. Today we are here for practice, the next we are not. Today we are on time for the fellowship, the next time we are late. We are still, we don't even turn up. Inconsistency. When we're serving God, we've got to understand that God demands excellence. He demands us to be there every single time. Let's, let me put it this way. If God was inconsistent in your life, what kind of spirituality would you have? 
If God shows up for you today and tomorrow he abandons you, where would you be spiritually? What would be the measure and strength of your spirituality? And so why do we do the same for God? Today we are here for him, the next we are not. Inconsistency. Scripture ch tells us about Jehu. He had a great zeal for the Lord in killing the prophets of Baal. And he got commendation from the Lord. But Jehu was not consistent. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. And we see that in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 16, all through to the end of that chapter. We see the story of Jehu. One minute he was zealous for God. One minute he was killing all the, um, the false prophets. And then the next minute, he did not follow through. Lack of prayer, as our brother said. Lack of prayer. And it is important to understand that the singing ministry is a spiritual one. Undertaken by vessels that have been chosen by God. We have been chosen by God. You have been chosen by God. I started this message by saying that we have not taken this honor to ourselves. We have not called ourselves to this ministry. I want to believe that every single one of you, it is because we have heard from God. God has called us to this ministry. And if such a ministry is to be effective and produce excellent results, then prayer must be offered regularly. Prayer must be at the center, the core of administration. To be a minister of God and be prayerless is not only a contradiction, it is actually a great sin before the Almighty God. Adopting worldly standards is another little fox we should watch out for. Adopting worldly standards, worldly styles of leading praise and worship. And this happens when there is no longer inspiration flowing from heaven. And when we begin to adopt worldly standards, worldly methods of singing, then that should be a red flag that something is not quite right. Then our tendencies will begin to drift towards looking to the world for inspiration. And because such an inspiration was not divinely sought, the result thereof will have little or no impact at all. Thus, a mediocre outcome. The children of Israel, they rejected God as their king. Why? Because they wanted a man, a mortal man as their king, so that they could be like other nations. And sometimes that happens in the choir ministry. I've been to this church. Oh, this is how they do their praise and worship. It's so good. To the eyes, it is good. To the physical eyes, it is good. To our ears, it sounds great. But what does the eyes of heaven see? What does the ears of heaven, what does it hear? And that is why we need to be sensitive. They wanted to be like other nations. And the result thereafter was tragedy for the nation of Israel. My goodness, they'd so deal with Israel. And this is who they wanted. And even after um, God had sent Samuel to tell them, this is the manner of the king you will have. He will do this, he will do that, he will do X, Y, Z. He will show you pepper. They still said, <laughs> we still wanted him. We still want him. They still insisted that that, that, was, who they that, that, that was who they wanted. And Israel literally was never the same after that. And all this that we've mentioned, all this that I've listed here, these are by no means an exhaustive list. But these are some of the things that we should check up and guard against. Some of the little foxes we have identified and talked about, they may seem insignificant. But let us remember the destructive power of termites when left unchecked. I don't know how many of us are familiar with Alexander the Great, perhaps the greatest conqueror of all time. He did not die with the edge of a sword. He did not die through the impact of a bullet. He died from, from malaria. And what caused that malaria? A mosquito bite. A mosquito bite. Killed him in his prime. He died at the age of 32. Alexander the Great, he conquered the whole world. Great military strategist. 
He didn't die on the battlefield. He didn't die in war. It was a little insect. That was the end of it. So as though we talk about little foxes, some of these things may seem inconsequential. But they have grave consequences if they live them, if we allow them to fester. Envy was what destroyed King Saul. We've talked about him. Talkativeness and indiscretion killed Samson. Discontentment and the lust brought King David to his knees. Doubt brought dumbness to Zacharias. Disobedience caused the children of Israel to wander to their death in the wilderness over a period of 40 years. In Matthew chapter 25, it is unpreparedness and lateness that denied the five virgins access to the banquet. The door was shut before them. And that is instructive for us in, in the singing ministry. Lateness and unpreparedness. Little foxes. The five virgins will tell you, be on time. In fact, be early. The door was shut. They were denied because they were, one, they were not prepared. And two, by the time they got their um, lamp ready, it was too late. It was too late. And this is why the word of God is telling us today to take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. For our vines have tender grapes. Just like the vines have tender grapes, likewise, the ministry that God has committed into our hands must be handled delicately and with great sensitivity. And that is why we cannot afford to gloss over or tolerate mediocrity in the ministry. Another peculiar and significant source of mediocrity in the music ministry is through negligence or irresponsibility. How many of you have heard people say, it's the Lord's work? Let's just pray. The Spirit of God will just take over. After all, God, God, you know, God provided a sacrifice for Abraham in place of Isaac. God will do it. How many of us have heard that before? It sounds spiritual, doesn't it? It sounds good. It's God's work. Oh, we just, let's just pray. The Spirit of God will just, he'll make up for us. The Spirit of God doesn't make up for laziness. That is not what the Spirit of God is there for. It sounds spiritual when we say these things. Let's just pray, 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 pray. If all you do is pray and not practice, then my, my friend, you will be the sacrifice on that stage. You will be the lamb for the slaughter on that stage. If all we do is just say, ah, let's we're, just pray, pray. I'm eating, there's a problem, how do we deal with it? Let's pray, the Spirit will guide us, the Spirit will lead us. If that's all we do, without practice, then we will be up for a rude awakening. And so it also goes the other way. If all we do is rely solely on our skills, if all we do is rely solely on our ability because we have an angelic singing voice or our skill of playing musical instruments, uh, without prayer, without spiritual preparation, then all we have offered the people is musical entertainment. Or worse, for some of us, you go on there and you're just blank. You're just blank. You've prepared and prepared and prepared and you're there. And the notes are not just coming. How many of us has that happened to? Where we've gone onto ministration and we're just going off key. And we can't explain it. Let's be honest, we're all friends in here. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, my sister. It happens. It happens. But, it, but that's a sign that we've parked God aside. We've not applied prayer. We've relied solely on our ability. Solely on our ability. And that reminds me of Samson. Samson went. And he just couldn't shake it off. And some, that's what happens to us. We come, we try and try. And I'm just singing off key. I don't understand why. We've placed so much emphasis on our skill and talent. So how do we deal with all this? We've mentioned all this. How do we deal with all this. And so I want us to go to the second point briefly. It says dealing with the little foxes. 
And scripture tells us about Daniel, and I think pastor made reference to him at the, at the very start of this conference, that he was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king um, taught to set him over the whole realm. And this is the same excellent attitude that God desires in all his ministers. And in order for us to have an excellent spirit to thrive, it is essential to deal with the attitudes and behaviors that pose a threat to excellence. All those who have attained excellence did so by continuous self-improvement. The disciples went from, they went from ordinary men to those, the Bible says, who turned the world upside down. We remember David's army in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2. It says, everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them and there were with him about 400 men. 400 men. They later became mighty warriors. David himself went from a shepherd boy, a simple shepherd boy, to the sweet psalmist of Israel. Development, training is important. Self-improvement is vital. Absolute vital. When we look at where Christ picked the disciples from and to how they ended up. When we see those 400 men of David, miserable men, the Bible calls them, and yet they later became men of valor. David, the shepherd boy, became the sweet psalmist of Israel. Self-improvement. These things just didn't happen overnight. These things just didn't happen in themselves. They applied themselves. They trained themselves. They developed. They took time out to grow in their skill. And unless you improve your competence by sharpening your skills, your performance can't be better. If you have no serious no serious commitment towards self-improvement. You can't achieve better productivity. The number of years you have spent in the ministry is not enough. You could, you could have been in the choir ministry for 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, the length of time you've spent in the singing ministry is not enough. If there's no excellence achieved through self-development, self-improvement. And although we can... We, we can't emphasize um, the importance of the Holy Spirit, but we must also give priority to the practical training towards achieving excellence. And so to deal with the little foxes that breed mediocre music ministry, there are some pertinent questions to consider for self-improvement. Number one, where are you now? Where are you now? Number two, what is your growth plan? What are you doing? What have you planned to improve and upscale yourself? Where do you want to get to? You've identified where you are now. You're not looking, where do I want to get to? What's the next level for me? What do I need to do to get there? How do I get there? When do I get there? And finding correct answers to these questions will put you on a path towards improving yourself that you do whatever you can to ensure that you grow. What are some of those things that we can do, aside from the things I've mentioned? What are those things that perhaps yourself as, as an example? What principles have you applied to yourself that has made you grow in the music ministry? Anyone, let's share together. What are those things that you've, principles over time, you've applied to yourself that has allowed you to grow? Anyone? So this is telling me that we're not growing, is that, and I don't want to believe that. Yes, my brother again. Commitment to be early to practice. Commitment. Don't get me wrong, things happen. Traffic, we get delayed here and there. But that shouldn't be a weekly thing. Commitment to arrive on time. Anything that we do. Yes, my sister. 
the commitment of practice. And is that just in choir practice, even at home? Commitment to practicing in the church and also at home. What other principles? Yes? Being able to take critiques, feedback, constructive feedback. Yes, my sister. In what way, man? How, do you, how, how have you done that? Listening to good music, listening to good music, reading musical books. These are all aspects in which we can grow and develop ourselves. I think our brother made a very good one, um, taking on constructive feedback, and I'll come back to that later. Sister at the back there with the baby. Praying before ministering. <laughs> um, the reason is because it makes me not just, I mean, to rely on God and not just, I mean, rely on my own strength. So that has really helped me. And also learning new songs as well. Learning new songs, praying before ministration. Yes. Singing always. Singing always. It's singing becomes, the expression of worship becomes part of you. It becomes part of your DNA. It becomes part of your fiber. You can't help yourself from um, doing it. Any other inspired principle? Yes, my sister here. <laughs> I did that, and I done that many times, and it's amazing how I cringe at myself when I listen to myself, ah, do I really sound like that? And I do that also for our choir, so I get our technical team to record. Part of our practice session is we play the praise and worship from the previous Sunday. We play it so we can all listen to ourselves. Our technical team have a fantastic way of, um, of isolating individual mics. So if somebody isn't singing their part correctly, you're exposed. So we do that regularly. We listen to ourselves. That's part of self-improvement. Yes, sir. I saw your hand briefly, sir. One can also attend. Uh, when you have an opportunity to attend something like this, it's very good to avail yourself um, that, op that opportunity. You get to learn things. You hear from others. And when you implement them, you will find out that you will be a better singer Thank, Thank you. you very much. So having conferences like this, they help. Um, we draw from various pool of experience of people. We pick out the ones that apply, that minister to us, and we follow through on them. And that helps us to develop. And just going back to what our young brother said about taking on um, constructive criticism. One thing I have come to learn is that if you're going to be in the choir ministry, you must have a element of a thick skin. If you haven't got thick skin to be told, my sister, you're singing off key, and that's the third and fourth time we've corrected you. If you haven't got the thick skin to take that humbly and make amends, then maybe the singing ministry is not for you. Maybe you might just have to reevaluate what am I doing here? Because times will come when the choir master will say, my brother, what are you doing? What are you singing? The, my brother on the keyboard, you keep giving us minor. We don't want minor, we want major. If you don't have thick skin to take on those criticisms, constructive criticisms, and they are not given so to you know, make you feel bad. They're not given to, to discourage you. They are given so we can improve, so we can better ourselves. And sometimes, depending on the on the wisdom and the leading of the choir leader, he will either do it privately or he will do it publicly. But there are reasons why he would choose to do it publicly. It is not to embarrass you in front of the team. It is just so the whole team can learn and we can move together. We're all there. We must remember that when we are being corrected, we must remember there's an overriding principle that is beyond, that is bigger than the individual and the choir. We are there for a single purpose, and that is to usher people before the presence of God. And that vision, that goal, is far bigger than my ego. It is far bigger than my pride. 
And that is so important that we're able to take on constructive criticisms. And we, we, we don't take it personal. We don't take it personal. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. We've mentioned several things here already. And, in, and, and I think the crux of it is the importance of training. Training ourselves so that we may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, so that the services we render for the kingdom of God can advance in our hands. Exercise themselves and practice more. Sister talks about singing all the time at home, attending practice on time, and, and beyond what we do in the, in the corporate choir practice, we take on personal um, practice at home. My, and sometimes it would cost money, particularly for the children, the children choir. I have my children, in fact, they're finished now. They have a private piano teacher that teaches them every Saturday. It will cost. It's not free. I have to pay for this. And that is so I can develop them in the music ministry. It would take sacrifice. It would take time. It would take our money. Whatever we do for God that doesn't cost us, you've given nothing. Whatever it is that we're doing for God right now in the music ministry, if it's not inconveniencing us, if it's not costing us anything, then you've given, you've offered nothing. And that is part of development. We must push ourselves and not allow ourselves to be, to settle in our comfort zone. I have sisters in our choir, brothers in our choir, who have a wide range. Perhaps somebody has told you, maybe you've been singing soprano for a long time, and that's your comfort zone. And the choir master says, you know, my sister, I think you can also stretch yourself. You can actually sing a bit of an alto. But then you're not used to singing alto because you've spent quite a number of your years singing soprano. Stretch yourself. Learn to sing alto. It's a blessing. I tell you what, as a choir leader, it's a blessing to have individuals in the choir with various with a, with a large range it just gives us that flexibility to move you from here to there but it's not sometimes we're hindered because the individual hasn't spent time to improve and develop themselves and there's only so much time you have in choir practice to be able to train somebody to sing to sing alto you cannot you can you can give some time to that in the practice session but the bulk of that training has to be on the person to go back and improve themselves. So if you've got a wide range, you are every choir leader's, you know, gift. But it just makes things easier. Flexibility. We also have to be faithful stewards. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2 tells us, Moreover, it is required in stewards that, it, that a man be found faithful. You know, God is not looking for the perfect stewards, but faithful stewards who are committed like Nehemiah and his men who had a mind to work. We must also cultivate a true heart of worship. A true heart of worship. In Psalm 95, verse 6 and 7, it says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will if ye will hear his voice. We understand that the music ministry is not merely a performance, but a means, by, by, um, a, a means to facilitate and to draw others to genuine worship. I like the way the songwriter pens it in that wonderful song written by Matt Redman. It's it called Heart of Worship. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. And this ought to be our disposition and attitude always as ministers of the, um, of, of, of the gospel, gospel and song. And our sister, I like our sister's example there, that she sings always, singing always. We practice the presence of God. We cultivate and we nurture a true heart of worship. And if we are to cultivate and nurture that true heart of worship, there must be total surrender. Total surrender, total yield, yieldedness. The hymn writer says, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. We surrender our time. We surrender our talent. We surrender our gift. We surrender ourselves. We lay it all on the altar of sacrifice so that we can become malleable instruments 
in the hands, in, in, in God's hands, and used for his glory. And after doing all that is required on our part, that's what I said, the Holy Spirit doesn't, it doesn't help lazy people. After we've done every single thing we can do on our part, understanding that God knows the effort you've put in. God sees the effort you've put in. And if you've genuinely done every single thing on your part, every single thing you can do, with every, you've mustered every strength to do all that you can, then the Spirit of God will come in and supplement and strengthen and develop all that we have done. We yield ourselves to the totality, total dependency of the Holy Spirit. And so as we conclude, by identifying and dealing with the little foxes that breed mediocre music uh, ministration, we will enhance our music ministry to, to bring glory to God. Through skill, preparation, nurturing hearts of worship, and fostering unity and collaboration, we can create an environment that allows the Holy Spirit to work powerfully through us. We remember that as we honor God with our talents and work together in unity, we will witness the transformational impact of our music ministration. And the Lord will do it for us in Jesus' name. Before we go to the Lord in prayer, there's, I too would also like us to sing a song. If you just rise on our, uh, on our feet, Heart of Worship. We're going to take that song, that song of consecration, Heart of Worship um, by Matt Redman. If you know it, please uh, sing along. And, we're going to, and that song is going to usher us into a, a period of prayer. So we just wait for our technical brothers to um, play that song for us. I'm coming back to the Heart of Worship. When the music fades, when the music fades and all is stripped when away, the music fades, simply come. Fades, all is all is stripped away, away and, I sim and I simply come, come. That will bless your heart. That will bless your heart. That will bless your heart. If we don't, let's sing along. I'll bring you a song. song. For a song in itself it is not what no, you have sung. You search much deeper than through the way things are sung. You're looking into my heart. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart. Of I'm coming back to the it's all about you, worship, and it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Lord Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made. When it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus.
the words of the song back to God in prayer and ask the Lord to bring us back to the heart of worship. Lord, bring me back to the heart of worship. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've been with my pride in the way I'm sorry. I love you more than a song. With my with my with my with my with my Bring me back to the heart of your worship. Bring me back to the center of your worship, O Lord. That I must decrease. I must decrease and you must increase. Lord, bring me back to the heart of worship. That my singing, that my ministration will be in spirit and in truth. Lord, look into my life. Search deep within me, O Lord. And everything, O Lord, that has been a hindrance, O Lord. Everything, Lord, that has been unprofitable to my ministry, Lord, strip away. Lord, strip away, O Lord, examine me, O Lord. Search me, O Lord. Remove every discrepancy, O Lord, in, in my worship. Remove every discrepancy, O Lord, in my ministration. Remove any little foxes, any little compromises here and there. Ask the Lord to read you, to read you of them. To remove every dross in your ministration. Every dross in your spiritual life. That your ministration may glorify him. Talk to the Lord in prayer. This is your ministry. God has called you. What do you want God to do with your ministration? What do you want God to do with your sacrifice, with your offering? What are those things you want God to remove? So that your ministration can be effectual. So that your ministration can go to the, to the next level. Come before the almighty God. Holding nothing back and say, Lord, I consecrate all to the altar. Maybe you're holding on to certain things that is not allowing you to give your best for the Lord. Tell the Lord, take this away from me. Remove this away from me, O oh Lord. Do what you need to do in my life. Remove what you need to remove in my life. That I might be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. Ask the Lord to equip you once again. To equip you with a mind to work. Diligence in training and development. Determination to build on your gifts and talents. Grace to be faithful, to be a faithful minister. Tell the Lord, Lord, equip me again with these things. Pray and ask the Lord to help you to be a music minister with a true heart of worship. Pray and ask the Lord to multiply grace. Grace upon you. For total surrender. That you may be a sharp threshing instrument of worship in the hands of the Almighty God. Pray and ask Him, Lord, to sharpen and anoint your music ministry. That in His hands, in His hands, we all, you and me and all of us together, will be a battle axe. His weapons of war in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' glorious name, we pray. In Jesus' glorious name, we pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for your love, O oh Lord, that always brings these things to our remembrance. And Lord, as we have heard, as you have instructed us, as you have counseled us, as we have challenged one another today, oh Lord, we are praying that all these things, Lord, will not have been in vain in Jesus' name. Uh, Lord, we are praying for the grace to apply all that you've instructed us through your word this day. We pray that, Lord, you grant us that excellent spirit and that mind to work. That this ministry that you've placed into our hands, Lord, will be a vibrant, a powerful, potent instrument in your hand in Jesus' name. We thank you because you know you've heard us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.